Hey everybody, it's Friday. That means it's time for SMG Viewers Comments, my weekly show where I respond to your comments and questions to the best of my ability and usually wind up pissing somebody off. Let's see who gets butt hurt this week. Fuck you, Glenn. Have you ever done a live in the studio type of recording? What are the challenges of this type of recording? Actually, I just did one in Toronto over Easter weekend with Protocol. We did two songs. I'm working on a great big premium lesson. And uh, we did one in the traditional fashion, you know, to a metronome, kind of part by part, all that kind of stuff. And they're going to be finishing up in my studio this weekend. So watch for a follow up. But we also did a second song that was completely live off the floor with the guitars and the vocals and everything going along with the drums. And it was freaking chaotic and kind of cool in the fact it wasn't Perfect. For what was originally a metal song, played in that fashion, turned out to be very punk in its attitude and it was kind of cool. Uh, I don't know if we can use it though, because if it's not perfect, everybody freaks the fuck out, that's not perfect. But I think we're censoring out humanity in the process. There's a lot of challenges to playing live off the floor. Number one, your band has really got to be able to pull that shit off. Um, and you definitely have to bring your A game to the studio. So if you want to do it, yes, it's possible, but man, you'd better practice or you're going to find out just how good you really are in a real hurry. Been struggling recording a good amp sound, probably because I'm using a Spider 5. Do I have to spend close to $2,000 on a good tube amp head to get a good heavy metal guitar sound? Great question, and I'm sure it's quite common. Absolutely freaking not. You know, you can start out at the low end, like the Joyo Zombie sounds phenomenal, and it's like it's a tube solid state hybrid. It's like about 200 bucks, and then a Harley Benton cab will cost you 160 to 180 bucks with shipping. So for under 400 bucks, you're already gonna get a really cool sound. But if you've got a few extra bucks to spend, uh, get the Harley Benton cab, it's awesome. There's a shootout you can check out. But my advice would be to look around for a used 6505 or a 5150 head and go with that because that head will probably last you your entire life. Uh, they're built like tanks, they're awesome, and they sound incredible, and they've wound up on numerous records and should be about $700 on the used market. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong there. I'm just take, taking a wild guess. It's been a while since I've searched for a used uh, 6505 head, so... Uh, let me know in the comments below if I screwed that one up. But if you're looking to save some money for a great tube head, look on the used market first. That would be my suggestion. Good luck, dude. Hey, Glenn, do you edit drums? How far from the grid is too far? How much takes you take with your demo videos on drums? A video about drum edits sold be on the list. People, try saying this stuff out loud as you type it. Do you know how hard it is to pronounce that stuff? Ah! Seriously though, I hate doing drum edits and it's one of those necessary evils kind of like when the band hits you with, oh, well, you gotta make the CD louder. And it's like you try explaining them things like dynamics and you know they don't wanna listen to that. I do have to do a video on the loudness war because I've got a very strong opinion on that. But when it comes to drum edits, I try to do as little damage as possible. And yes, I say damage because I am trying to capture the drummer and I really miss the sound of drummers. Do you guys remember when drummers used to be on records. Nowadays, we don't get that. We get sample replaced. We hear what the engineer did to the drums and we get, we don't even get a reasonable facsimile of the drums anymore. We get a complete work of fiction. And I think that sucks. And I say, bring back the drummer because drummers are awesome and they're sorely lacking from modern metal. So my advice would be, Live with a little bit of imperfection because your record will have much more feeling and it won't sound like everything else out there. Maybe a metal cover contest of songs from Disney movies? Yeah, right. Dealing with an obscure radio show is bad enough. There's no way in hell I'm taking on the mouse. Uh, seriously though, keep your eyes peeled this weekend. I've got an announcement coming up about a new contest in the works that I think you guys are gonna dig and I'm gonna still be giving away the same awesome prizes. The Slick Audio Production PC, the Earthworks drum mic set, and something really cool from Two Notes as well. You guys are definitely gonna wanna check it out. Um, that's gonna be out probably Sunday afternoon. I'm thinking that's how it's looking at this point. Anyway, we'll see what's up. Start a new contest. Best original song about how much lawyers suck. Great idea, you go first. Do you think there's any merit in terms of tone to using dedicated mid-price emulator, roughly 1K, like a Headrush or Helix LT over using a decent amp VST in the box? 
We can't all get a camera, and I record in my apartment, just trying to make the best choice of available options. Well, I'll say this. My very good friend Lee Daffron over at the fretboard.co.uk plays with a Helix LT and absolutely loves his. It's definitely a very good all-in-one solution for a bedroom guitar player. There's nothing wrong with that. That being said, you can get some really great tones for little or no money whatsoever if you do your homework when it comes to VSTs. I really have to do an episode on freeware VSTs and where to get the best cabinet impulses. It's not like something really cool is coming out very soon. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. You need some new ads, man. We have seen DistroKid like a million times now. Even if I would be releasing music after seeing your ads so many times, I will not use it just to piss you off. Thanks. Oh, you're not going to use it out of spite. What a great idea. You're going to be a wonderful wife one day. Door-to-door -door CD sales sounds like a good way to get shot. Need I remind you that not all of us live in a place in the world where walking across somebody else's lawn means you're going to be fired upon. Seriously, if you're banging on doors and people are answering with you, you with guns, that's kind of frightening. But okay, yeah, if you do live in a country like that, yeah, good idea. Better not do that. I don't want to ruin it for anyone, but I think that comment was sarcastic and or a troll comment. I mean, no one is that stupid, right? Clearly, you have never dealt with anyone who has a degree in piano. Hey, Glenn, have you made any notable improvements since starting your YouTube channel? Either comment suggestions or from new equipment being sent in via, via fearless gear reviews, unboxings, etc. Well, first and foremost, I think we've just kind of streamlined the whole production process around here. Um, I'm currently shooting on a Panasonic GH5, and I really like working with it because I can focus my camera from my sitting position here. It works. It's got a spectacular uh, remote app. It's great. Uh, Triad Orbit's been a huge help. I've got my mic just suspended off camera here. And that's actually on a ceiling mount, so when I'm done, I can just fold it out of the way. It's great. As for gear in the studio, yeah, the, the Atom monitors are freaking spectacular. Uh, they're just simply amazing. The Stam Audio SA-2A is killer. And let's not forget the RME Fireface UFX Plus. That's still probably my favorite piece of gear in the studio because it just works and it stays the hell out of the way and it sounds awesome, which in my opinion is what good gear should do. That and the Total Mix FX software is simply spectacular. But for the most part, like I said, it's just about kind of, you know, streamlining my workflow and figuring out what works and what doesn't and uh, being able to maintain a three show a week release schedule. That can be kind of brutal at times and uh, definitely would not have been possible when I started this four years ago. What's your favorite genre of metal to record? Greetings from the Netherlands. Okay, this is where I'm going to show my age. I still like recording the metal bands with the singers. I grew up listening to guys like Rob Halford, Bruce Dickinson, Dio, Ozzy, Ian Gillen, Jeff Tate. You know, guys with just amazing voices. So, although I've recorded a lot of metalcore over the years, I can't say I'm a huge fan of it. You know, the guitar and drum stuff's kind of cool. But I've just never been a huge fan of that whole growly type of vocals. I much prefer the virtuoso, almost operatic type vocals of, like, classic metal. That's kind of my thing. And that's why I always jump at the chance to work with a guy like Siegfried Song, who's just fucking amazing. The world needs more singers like that. Hey Glenn, is there a way for indie musicians to record small batches of CDs without losing their shirts on mastering, studio time, and minimum quality order fees? There are still folks who like to buy CDs at open mics and festivals. I'd like to put together a CD before putting it out online. What's the most cost-effective way to get recorded at mastering without producing a garbage CD? Thanks! Well, this goes back to the old triumvirate of record production. Good, fast, and cheap, and you can only have two. Make your choice! The thing with CD productions, yeah, you can get like limited runs of like 100 discs because a lot of smaller CD shops have started offering that because they realize nobody's buying these fucking things anymore. You can start out for a reasonable price for like a couple hundred bucks and you'll get maybe 100 CDs in like little folders. And then if you want to add like a jewel case and shrink wrap and printing on the desk and all that kind of stuff, your price goes up and up and up. Still though, you're going to probably spend a lot of your money on studio time and just getting the songs right, right at the production stage as well. So you really need to ask yourself this question. How many songs do you really need to put out? And would it make more sense to record songs in small batches of say like three and four and do an EP every year or have a disc full of maybe 10 or 12 songs and only have that come out once every four years. So, did you check out Superior Drummer 3? If so, what do you think of them compared to Real Drums? No, no, I have not. I've been too busy miking up that DeMavery kit and working with Real Drums. Although, if you guys want to see a review of Superior Drummer 3, let me know in the comments. Maybe I can make that happen. That might be kind of neat, actually. Hey, Glenn! So, I've been wanting to get myself an acoustic drum set instead of the electronic one that I have currently. I'm on a very tight budget and need a drum kit that does not sound horrible. Do you have any suggestions? Yes, check your local classified use section and look for a Tom or Rockstar kit or possibly a Yamaha kit. 
Both of those brands are excellent bang for the buck. You'll need to buy new skins. I highly, highly, highly recommend Aquarians. Uh, they've been spectacular here in the studio, but that would be my first suggestion uh, and see if you can find a kit with symbols included because that will save you a bloody fortune as well. Good luck, dude. Hey, Glenn, so my band's bassist is a great player, but he's difficult to work with and is losing interest in the music we're playing. However, when it's just me and him, it's fine, but if there's just one more person, he never pays attention. What should I do? Well, if you want to have a successful band, he either needs to step up and learn how to play with other people, or you need to fire him. If he's losing interest, stop spinning your wheels and jettison him. You'll just do everybody a favor at this point. What about maybe adding some additional perks to the Patreon? Like, there's no reason to give $15 a month if I'm not firing a band member. However, if you added a patrons-only Discord, I'd definitely be all over that shit. Funny how the internet works. Now, I briefly looked up Discord at some kind of gaming chat system. You guys let me know if you think that'd be cool. That might be something I can make happen. By the way, thanks for bringing up Patreon. That reminds me, I just want to thank everybody who stepped up and helped support the channel on my Spend a Buck, Give a Fuck campaign. And for those of you who might not know, there are people out there in the world who think if you use words like fuck, shit, cunt, or piss, you shouldn't be able to make a living doing it. Well, I say fuck that. You guys deserve better. And I've always spoken to you guys in terms that everybody actually uses in day-to-day -day language. So we started this idea a couple weeks back, and the whole idea is if we can get my Patreon up past a certain threshold, I can turn my in-video ads off. And that way, I don't have to worry about somebody yanking the rug out from under me because I use the word fuck, which I think is absolutely fucking moronic. Due to the fact that there are 264,000 of you guys out there, I'm asking maybe a couple of you guys to maybe spend a buck a month. Chuck it my way and I will keep the shits and fucks and cunts coming your way and keep everybody happy. Thank you so much for your support. You can follow the link in the description of my Patreon below, and we've got all kinds of cool Patreon perks coming, including some very limited edition merch, um, including posters, which are gonna be very fucking cool. Check it out. All right, that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Please keep those comments and questions coming because I want to hear from you guys. And if you love what I do, head on over to my Patreon, spend a buck, give a fuck, and help keep YouTube fun.